So back in 1994, I had been dabbling in uh, research in saline lakes, like Mono Lake, for about 15 years at that point, and had just become uh, interested in expanding into other aquatic realms, like streams. And so I was, uh, I had the, the, uh, the good fortune to uh, get involved um, at an uh, early stage of uh, monitoring um, this uh, project of remediation of acid mine drainage at Leviathan Mine. So um, just, I, I want to reflect a little bit on some of the experiences and lessons from that before I launch into the talk. So this, this could have well been at the end of the talk as well as at the beginning, but I'll just preface it with this, that, that uh, some of the lessons that come from this are that when opportunities come by, when chances come by, um, especially those of you who are early in your careers, uh, take advantage of those opportunities, take those chances, and um, in particular, uh, use those chances to do long-term monitoring. Uh, there's lots of insights to be gained from data sets that are collected over long periods of time, and they're, they're quite rare, so you can get uh, important information just by sticking with the project for a long period of time. Uh, don't isolate yourself. Uh, interdisciplinary collaborations and coordinated research are really the key to um, keeping you fresh and learning new things, continuing to be a, a, a student throughout your career. Um, once you've gathered information, if it's uh, important in the public domain, um, advocate with that evidence. Use it to inform decisions. Um, and, and it's also really important not only to tell the story of your research in academic forums, but um, to share that information through news releases, through press, through connections with your local communities, or through connection with areas near where you do your research so that there's a wider appreciation in your community about the significance and importance of the work that you're doing. Um, and of course, become obsessed with weird stuff because that's how you become an expert. <coughs> so I'm going to tell you the story of Leviathan Mine. To start with, just the location of the mine. It's uh, southeast of Lake Tahoe. Um, it's at an elevation of around 2,000 meters. All the sites are and the, and the, uh, the we use for monitoring as well as the mine source uh, itself. Um, it's an open pit mine. It uh, covers about 250 acres. This is the, the layout of the mine. Uh, the, the, the site itself, the open pit itself, which you saw in the very first opening sli uh, slide here, this is a, uh, we're, we're pulling back from it now and looking down on the site um, as it is facing north. So you're looking at the mine site down here where the red bubble is. Uh, it's near the California Nevada State Mine. Uh, uh, the, the Leviathan site itself, uh, the Leviathan Creek and Aspen Creek are on either side of the open pit, and then off to uh, further to the east is uh, uh, an unaffected drainage, Mountaineer Creek, that we have been using for the uh, control site. So back in the 1950s, uh, Anaconda Copper had a big mine out near Yarrington and they needed to process the copper ore that they were mining from this site, and they needed a source of sulfuric acid to process this. So they found a rich ore body of sulfur at Leviathan Mine, which they then used to mine and produce the sulfuric acid to process um, the copper ore at the Anaconda Mine. So, in many uh, uh, metal mining operations, many precious metal mining operations, the uh, exposure of uh, the subsurface soils um, to oxygen and water uh, in the presence of any kind of sulfur ore will often create this acidic drainage, this dilute sulfuric acid that flows off the site. So you can imagine that a mine like Leviathan which had as its ore body the sulfur ore itself, rather than any precious metals there. It was mined for the sulfur ore itself. And so um, after a few adits, um, which are horizontal tunnels that had initially been built to mine the ore, um, the site was opened up as an open pit site. So there's basically a giant meteorite-like crater there that was um, developed over time to mine this sulfur ore. And as that sulfur ore was exposed, um, to oxygen and to water, it um, created this dilute sulfuric acid solution, which in turn 
um, would uh, dissolve um, uh, pyrite, um, iron sulfide, and that iron sulfide would be converted uh, into iron oxides. And so what you're looking at here is this formation, this, this orange paint-like uh, substrate um, that's known as yellow boy. Sure, why it's called yellow boy. If anybody has any insights to that, I'd appreciate knowing this because I've looked for a long time. Anyway, it's a uh, orange to yellow colored um, iron oxide form. It's essentially rust that's on the bottom of the stream. And so there's this physical precipitate that you get forming in the streams, um, especially early on in this process of formation. But in turn, these uh, dilutes, this dilute sulfuric acid is also dissolving. Um, metals in the soils around the, um, the, the area of the, of the mine, the open exposed minerals that are there. And so you get um, solutions of toxic metals coming off with this. So uh, uh, after the mine closed, and it was only really operating during the 1950s, the challenge was then to be able to remediate this site and to fix the problem. So um, uh, the work that I did was actually to find out whether or not the treatments that were going on at the mine site were effective. By looking at the canaries in this coal mine, using aquatic macroinvertebrates as our, as our canaries. So how did they deal with this acid mine drainage problem at Leviathan? How did they control this? Or how have they been controlling this, I should say, because it's still an ongoing process. And, and the two primary ways that um, have been used at Leviathan Mine are a chemical precipitation and a biological treatment uh, mode. So for chemical precipitation, basically it's the, the addition of lime to uh, ponds that were created to catch runoff from the open pit mine. And in those um, ponds and in reactors along the sides of the pond, that you see in this upper left-hand um, photograph here, um, the, uh, the, 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 the collected um, runoff from the mine site from the ponds was treated with um, calcium oxides, and that would precipitate out calcium sulfate along with a lot of the metals, the uh, toxic metals that were also in solution. And so um, with the precipitation of the gypsum, the calcium sulfate, along with the metals, that material was then gathered as a sludge and dried out, uh, and overlying water uh, released, um, essentially cleansed of those toxic metals, uh, released back into Leviathan Creek. So this was mainly done in the Leviathan uh, part of the drainage, Leviathan Creek part of the drainage, and over on the um, Aspen Creek side of the drainage, a smaller part of the drainage where there was overburden from the mine site, the um, water that ran off that site was instead treated in a bioreactor. A bioreactor is essentially a microbial um, uh, culture uh, built in a artificial wetland that was comprised of sulfate-reducing bacteria that essentially reversed that reaction of the uh, pyrite oxidation back to pyrite and precipitates out the metals again, elevates the pH, and, uh, and so thereby also uh, corrects the acid mine uh, problem. So the combination of those two things in the upper part of the watershed are what have been used to try and control the acid mine drainage problem over time. And uh, you see what it can look like at the confluence of the um, unaffected part of the drainage, Mountaineer Creek here, which is coming in from the left side, and Leviathan Creek coming down on the right side with its load of, uh, of um, ferric hydroxide, yellow boy. So the setting of the mine again, here's another view of the mine looking at uh, the, the open pit mine site. Leviathan Creek comes down on the right side of the mine uh, and Aspen Creek comes down on the left side of the mine, and then over on the far left here, do I have a pointer somewhere here, Jim? No, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> anyway, over here on the left side of the drainage, this is Mountaineer Creek coming down. So you can see Mountaineer Creek is a drainage that's outside of the influence of the mine site itself. So this is the site that we've used for monitoring for a long period of time. And, and, and so you can see this as a schematic um, you can see Aspen Creek and Leviathan Creek essentially flow beside and through the open pit mine site. And then immediately below them are two sites that we've monitored for a long period of time on the lower part of Aspen Creek and, the, um, and, and essentially the upper part of Leviathan Creek immediately below the mine. And then you can see we have in green here, the, uh, it, the red are the AMD affected sites and the green are the reference sites that we've used over time. Several on the Mountaineer Creek drainage and then several outside the Mountaineer 
creek drainage in external watersheds that are nearby. Um, and uh, the, the Leviathan Creek um, watershed uh, and that also flow to the East Fork of the Carson River. So in this last picture, um, this isn't the best picture, but um, the, 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 the flows eventually make it down to the East Fork of the Carson River, where when I first began the study in the mid-90s, um, there was uh, 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 acid mine drainage and yellow boy flowing directly into the East Fork of the Carson River. Um, where Mountaineer Creek and Leviathan Creek join, the creek changes its name to Bryan Creek, just to give you some points of reference there. So we began our benthic macroinvertebrate sampling along with um, uh, concurrent sampling of dissolved metals and sediment metals, uh, again in 1995, and have continued and do continue to, to, to uh, monitor this project. So within the first year after that, 1994 CABW meeting, we began this research at Leviathan. Okay, so um, this mine site has a mixture of metals. What do you do if you have a mixture of metals in order to try and express the different toxicity of these metals? Each has a different concentration of which metals may be toxic. So when you have um, a variety of different met metals, how do you go about making a consistent, comparable measurement of what the total toxicity might be? Well, one of the approaches that's been used by um, the EPA is the um, cumulative criterion unit, CCU. So the metals that are present at Leviathan Mine include aluminum, iron, nickel, selenium, arsenic, copper, manganese, and zinc. Those would be the primary players. There's some other minor metals that are there, but it's quite a soup of toxic metals that are right there, and each of which has a different level of toxicity, chronic toxicity. So if you look at bioassay data um, for the toxicity of aluminum, for example, it's right around 80 micrograms per liter chronic exposure that um, above which you start to see impacts on growth and reproduction in a variety of bioassay organisms. So if the concentration of aluminum in your catchment is 80 micrograms per liter, um, then that is a, a CCU value, a cri critical criterion unit of 1.0. Because if your EPA, uh, toxic criterion is 80, and your dissolved concentration is 80, you have a value of 1.0. So each of these metals can be added up according to its chronic criterion level, and the additive value then of that is your CCU for the site. So we're going to express metals concentrations uh, relative to their toxicity, assuming that there is an additive effect. So if you have a, a 0.5 value of CCU for aluminum and a 0.5 value of nickel, it exceeds that 1.0 threshold. So there's the presumption that that would then be toxic to aquatic organisms because of the additivity of those. So part of this study was actually to try and test this idea to see whether or not there is this additivity in the toxicity of metals and to see whether or not the ecological responses that we were seeing at the mine site corresponded to this EPA um, CCU criterion. So in the next graph, um, remember that a log CCU of one equals zero. And now what we're looking at here is a record across a number of different sites that we did our monitoring in of what the CCU concentration was. So we're going to first talk about the chemistry at these sites. So um, on the far left end, um, on this site, this site here, this is Leviathan Creek below the mine. This is Aspen Creek below the mine. So these are very close to the source areas. These are the downstream areas. This is the lower end of Leviathan Creek. And then this is the, up, the uh, upper... Uh, uh, part of Bryant Creek and the lower part of Bryant Creek. So we're moving downstream from the two source areas that feed in. And then this is the reference site. So first of all, you can see the reference site is all below zero. The Mountaineer Creek site all has um, CCU values that are well below the, 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 uh, the, the chronic criterion level. Um, the site closest to the mine with the most aluminum, for example, um, as the primary toxin is Leviathan below mine. And you can see that um, it has uh, consistently high values above a CCU of 1.0, this zero line right here. But what you also see is that in 
2005 and 6 and 2010 to 11, high flow years, there's spiking of these chronic criterion units. So it tells us that um, there's also, um, uh, even though the metals are reduced over time, uh, even at that site, um, during high flow years, there's mobilization of those metals. So um, those metals are being mobilized by the high flows and runoff that's coming off the landscape that's introducing those <coughs> metals back into the stream. But you can also see that at places like um, Leviathan, the lower end of Leviathan, before its confluence with Mount Muir Creek, metal concentrations have been going down over time and are now below this chronic criterion threshold in the most recent years. The same is the case in both the Bryant Creek sites. Early on, they had CCU values that are very high, and now they're consistently at the same levels as you see for the Mountaineer reference site. Aspen Creek also has decreased over time, but for the most part, is still above this chronic criterion threshold. So um, uh, th those, those two sites that are closest to the mine remain in a condition where it looks like the toxic concentrations of these metals should, in theory anyway, um, be above that, that, uh, that threshold. So now let's look at what the biological data look like in relationship to this uh, history of changing uh, metals and remediation. So the upper graph here is Mount Muir Creek. And Mount Muir Creek, along with other reference sites, um, can be used as a way of assessing what the condition is, in this case, of what the, uh, the EPT diversity is, the Mayfly, Stonefly, Caddisfly diversity, as one of the many indices that we use. And this dashed line here is the 10th percentile of all the reference data, including Mountaineer Creek and other sites, over time. Um, and then the next uh, graph down uh, still has the Mountaineer dark line plotted on it, but also the Bryant Creek sites. So you can see that over time, uh, and in fact, corresponding to the, in, the improvement of metals concentrations, we've seen an increase in the EPT diversity to a point where in about 2007, 2008, 2009, conditions improved so that they match that 10th percent, match and exceed that 10th percentile of the rest reference condition. If we look at Mountaineer Creek, the lower end of Mountaineer Creek, we've got the same graph here now and we we're looking at the Bryant Creek recovery sites and Leviathan here with the diamond symbols, um, occasionally improving and then sometimes falling back below that line, improving, falling back below that line. And um, these dips correspond to the periods of higher runoff in 2005, 2006, and 2011 when there were higher concentrations of metals getting into the site and correspondingly poorer conditions in the EPT diversity at that time. And then finally, if we look at the two um, sites that are nearest the mine, uh, Leviathan Creek in the squares and Aspen Creek um, as the asterisk symbols, um, you can see that they have never yet achieved that um, reference condition, though they are improving over time. So we have some indication that uh, we have successful recovery at the sites that are furthest downstream from the mine, but there's still ongoing problems um, at the sites that are closest to and uh, just to give you some idea of how that uh, uh, affects the um, overall density and uh, trophic structure of the sites, all the reference sites and their average um, structure in terms of functional feeding group composition is indicated in this, this uh, upper square here. You can see that there's large numbers of grazers in this system. And if you look down here, the size of these pies are proportional to the average density over the full period of study. And uh, you can see that the densities are much lower at the Leviathan below mine site. But most notably, there's very few grazers in these systems. They start to recover as you go downstream uh, to the Leviathan, uh, lower part of Leviathan Creek, and especially in the Bryant Creek site. So these <coughs> densities have recovered, and the grazers are much more abundant than they are at the upstream sites, though still not recovered quite to the condition of reference stream. So we can see that there's trophic recovery there. We also see that evident at, that, at this uh, lower site on Leviathan Creek. So this is Leviathan Creek just before its confluence with the reference Mountaineer Creek stream. And you can see that if you compare the early period of time, 1998 to 2006, when there was just incomplete uh, capture and treatment of the acid mine drainage waste, 
um, compared to the later period when treatment and capture was um, much more complete. You can see that there's been a significant increase across all the functional feeding groups here. Um, and we see this at some of the other sites as well, but particularly at this site. So um, we've got um, an indication not only that there's recovery downstream, but that there's also trophic recovery going on as well, functional recovery. So if we look at this data, instead of, instead of looking at it in terms of the EPT composition and the trophic composition, if we look at it in terms of community structure as an NMS ordination plot, this is showing all the points from all the sites over time, over the full period of the study. And um, uh, the sites that are here in green and red represent either the Mountaineer Creek reference site or other um, reference sites that are part of the data set. They're all off towards this side of the ordination, correlated with higher pH levels, non-acidic pH levels, and with time. Um, and the time function is, is really related to the fact that these sites that are over here, AMD exposed sites, used to be in a, at a very different level of community structure. So the closer these points together are, the uh, more similar the biological communities are. So the communities that are out here at this end of the ordination have a very different biological composition, a very different species composition than the sites do over here at this end of the ordination. And these are all correlated with high concentrations of CCUs and high concentrations of metals. And then over time, improving. So if we look at that Leviathan um, above Mountaineer site, this lower Leviathan Creek site that serves as a good index site because it integrates the problems both from Aspen Creek and from Leviathan Creek and the different mixtures of metals that are coming from those sites, we can look at the, in particular at how that site has improved over time. So I'm just going to look at, a, at a, a, have you look at a series of plots here over time that show um, this is the reference distribution of, of sites in this um, ellipse. And this is the, where, um, in fall of 1998, Leviathan above Mountaineer started off at the far end of that ordination. And then over time, it starts to improve really radically as we get into 2002, 2003, as treatments have been going on. And then we start to see improvements occurring in the fall, and then relapses occurring in the spring. Improvement in the fall, relapse in the spring, and so on. And it's actually pausing right here in 2005 and 2006, not moving towards the reference ellipse because of the fact that these are years of very high flow and mobilization of metals. They start to recover then in 2007. Again, you're getting this spring fall improvement, spring relapse, fall improvement, spring relapse, until in 2011, again, another very high flow year, falls outside the ellipse, again, a, a much more of a mobilization of metals in this year, and then improving conditions again following that as we get into drought years, and the capture is almost com is, is complete at this stage. So no more um, acid mine drainage, and we're seeing um, conditions where uh, we've got uh, recovery to within that ellipse and uh, that reference ellipse. And this is just uh, also to emphasize at that same site, if we look at total diversity, just as another indicator, that um, the treatment and capture are seasonally uh, going on. That's a part of this that I, I, I failed to mention already. But um, the site's up at a relatively high elevation. And so access during the winter is difficult. They basically had to abandon doing these, those treatments um, over the winter and spring months. So they get up there in the late spring and they start treating the uh, acid mine waste at that period of time and do that until about, right about this time of the year when they have to leave the site in preparation for snows coming and inaccessibility um, of, uh, of the crews and the operations that go on up there. So at that time, two of the major sources that are still leaking into Leviathan Creek are no longer captured and they're going back into the creek. So what uh, we see as a biological signal of that is recovery occurring in our fall samples, which are uh, uh, being taken at the end of the, uh, the, the fall season after the treatments have occurred, and then a relapse in the spring sampling after there has been a period with, without those flows being captured. So in summary, uh, what we're seeing is that the remediation actions are reducing the metals load and that we're also seeing um, a qualified success in ecological recovery where the sites down on, on Bryant Creek are improved to reference conditions, so that's quite good news, but we're still seeing areas uh, upstream near the mine that have not yet recovered, 
And this is telling us that what we need to do is have year-round capture and treatment so that we get a complete recovery of ecological health of these sites. Um, I also didn't mention, didn't show the data, but um, the ecological indicators bear out that that CCU of one that's derived from a laboratory bioassay actually corresponds very nicely to the ecological indicators. So it's a, a good validation of the use of the EPA's chronic uh, criterion units for evaluating uh, metals toxicity in mine sites. So just thanks to my co-authors, Bruce Medhurst, Ned Black, who's here today, uh, Tom Sook, formerly Oahu Regional Water Board, who really helped initiating this monitoring program, and then support from US EPA, the Army Corps, Atlantic Richfield, State of California, the Forest Service, my colleagues Terry Shortwood Clements and Dave Bookwalter that, that uh, helped advise some of this work. And if you're interested in seeing kind of the full story, there's a recently published paper in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. And uh, with that, I can take a few questions. <laughs> of this kind of the estimate range, or in my case, I was at the uh, Eastern Kentucky, which was affected by the surface mining, and then also it was an alkaline stream. But uh, the good point about that was this yellow boy you talked about, it's precipitates and actually seals and cements all the substrates. The question is, once you actually treat the water that's coming into the streams, does that actually affect that uh, the, the yellow boy? Does it turn into white boy or anything else? Or <laughs> it, it does redissolve. Absolutely, it does, does redissolve. Yeah, the, some of the Bryant Creek sites when we first started doing this study were cemented, just as you described, where there was just no interstitial space in between rocks at all. It's cemented, and you could hardly even sample in the substrate because of the fact that you couldn't move rocks around. It was like a cemented matrix. But within about three or four years after that, with the capture of those flows, um, the yellow boy did redissolve. So it's not a, uh, a perennial problem. Do you have uh, a measure of the toxicity before the mining began? Or another way to ask that question is, what is uh, the baseline towards which your, your remediation is going? When do you know? When to stop your remediation. Yeah. So the baseline is based on those reference sites. So we don't have before mining began on the Leviathan Creek. There was no data collected that for, for bioassessment anyway before the mining began on the site. Because it really began, well, it began in earnest in the early 1950s when it was turned into an open pit mine. Back in the 1800s, there were several adits that were, that were put in, and so it was mined for copper sulfate at that time. But in earnest, the mining began as the open pit site in the 1950s. There's no biological data there. So we're using this reference data from the adjacent Mountaineer Creek site, which has the same drainage size as, as the Leviathan Creek site, but there's no mining on that site. So very comparable environmental settings. And then we've included, along with that Mountaineer site, a lot of other reference drainages. So we can use the data from all that collection of reference sites that spatially vary um, as well as the temporal variation that goes over time for us to be able to set both a metals baseline and a biological baseline that's used as the criterion for recovery of either biological or chemical conditions. On the, uh, I'm not sure if I saw this correctly, but when you were showing the EPT graphs, it yep. looked like before the, or they crashed on the high flows, as you said, Right. And six months later, more or less, they were back in higher than before. Right. Is that true? That is true. Right. Um, it appears that the mobilization of the metals in uh, over the winter and late spring, when the flows are really coming up, is what creates that that um, uh, um, um, movement of those metals back off the landscape and, and the loading of those metals. But because of those high flow conditions, they're actually ecologically favorable conditions. By the fall, after those metals have been mobilized, they're no longer there in the flows that are coming back into the creek. And so you actually get a really rapid recovery in the fall of those high flow years. Thank you, Dave. 